A certain man made a great supper and invited many. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today, my dear faithful, we are within the octave of the great feast of Corpus Christi, the feast of the Holy Eucharist. On Holy Thursday, when the Holy Eucharist was instituted, the attention of the sacred liturgy is principally focused on the terrible sufferings of our Lord's passion and death, the sacrifice of the cross. On the Thursday, immediately after the octave of Pentecost, however, Holy Mother Church presents to us the feast of Corpus Christi and its octave, so that for an entire week we might consider the ineffable miracle of God's love for mankind, the Holy Eucharist. Today's gospel, while a parable, is sadly often too close to reality. The certain man in the parable is God himself. The great supper of which the parable speaks the divine banquet of the Holy Eucharist, where we might find an unending and sweet nourishment for our souls to sustain us in all the trials and tribulations of life. And who are we but those invited to the banquet, those who so easily respond, I pray thee, hold me excused. To be sure, we have not gone so far as to turn our backs altogether on the divine invitation. But there is much more that we share in common with the ungrateful guests in the parable than that which separates us from them. The three excuses that are given in the parable represent the spirit of the world, the spirit of the flesh, and the spirit of the devil, all of which wage war against our sanctification. It would be a terrible tragedy were we to become so imbued with one of these that by mortal sin, we would reject God entirely, choosing instead some creature as our ultimate end. <clears throat> the pursuit of power, of pleasure, or of wealth. While we might not go so far as to reject the divine invitation outright, how easily do we not at least in practice, respond but very poorly to this invitation. For there is much in our hearts that is not of God. If we could but understand the smallest glimpse of the great mystery that is the Holy Eucharist, we should tremble in awe before the tabernacle. We should purify our hearts with the utmost care and be overwhelmed with transports of joy and love whenever we should have the occasion to welcome our divine Savior into our hearts in Holy Communion. One worthy reception of the Holy Eucharist provides us all that would be required to in that one moment become truly a saint. As we see in the wonderful example of Blessed Imelda Lambertini, who so ardently longed to receive Holy Communion that when at last she did, she died in an ecstasy of love. Indeed, so precious is the reception of Holy Communion 
that everything else in our lives ought to be thought of as a preparation or a thanksgiving for this great gift. With longing expectation, we ought to count the weeks, the days, the hours, the moments, until we might once again receive our blessed Lord into our hearts. While at the same time, all of the books in the world could not contain enough prayers of thanksgiving to adequately express the joy and gratitude which we ought to have towards Jesus in the most blessed sacrament. If we do not yet approach the Holy Eucharist with such fervor, it is because our hearts are divided. There is but little room to begin with in our small, cold hearts, but then we are quick to clutter our affections with vain or foolish or worthless things until there is perhaps but a tiny ember remaining of that fire of charity which we had once received at our baptisms. When we hear the call to become a saint, how frequently do we not respond deep within our hearts. I pray thee, hold me excused. We might be willing enough, even eager, to attend Mass on Sundays. We might strive, even courageously, to avoid mortal sin. We might say our prayers with a degree of regularity. We might fast and abstain on the appointed days. But when the call of grace touches our hearts, calling us to perfection, to the heights of sanctity, calling us to abandon ourselves entirely to the holy will of God, to live entirely for heaven, we shrink back. We respond to God, I pray thee, hold me excused. It is this coldness in the hearts of men that gives such grief to the sacred heart of Jesus. He holds out to us his divine heart in his hand, bruised, bleeding, crowned with thorns, pierced with a lance, consumed by a burning fire of love, a testimony and also a reproach a testimony that no sacrifice has been too great, that for the sake of our redemption, he would not and has not willingly endured it. A reproach that such immeasurable love is so coldly returned. What is the remedy for us but the worthy and frequent reception of the Holy Eucharist? Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world, the priest says, before Holy Communion. The Holy Eucharist is the remedy for sin. We ought therefore to approach it as frequently as possible, but only with a right and devout intention, keeping always in mind the teaching of St. Pius X when he encouraged all the faithful to frequent communion. <coughs> he says, a right intention consists in this, that he who approaches the holy table should do so, not out of routine or vainglory or human respect, but for the purpose of pleasing God, 
of being more closely united to him by charity and of seeking this divine remedy for his weaknesses and defects. The Holy Pontiff goes on to explain that although it is most expedient that those who communicate frequently or daily should be free from venial sins, nevertheless it is sufficient that they be free from mortal sin with the purpose of never sinning mortally in the future. And if they have this sincere purpose, it is impossible but that daily communicants should gradually emancipate themselves from even venial sins and from all affection thereto. Reminding us finally that the fruit to be received from Holy Communion is always in proportion to our own dispositions. The saint instructs especially, care is to be taken that Holy Communion be preceded by serious preparation and followed by a suitable thanksgiving according to each one's strength, circumstances, and duties. Pray for the grace, my dear faithful, of receiving the Holy Eucharist both frequently and worthily for there can be no greater remedy for our faults, no greater assistance to virtue than this. Pray likewise, my dear faithful, for many good and holy priests. For in the providence of God, it is only in the hands of the priest that this immeasurable channel of grace is made available to us. Pray for the grace, my dear faithful, to answer well the divine invitation which is held out to each and every one of us, that by means of the fervent and worthy reception of the Holy Eucharist, we might become a saint. Called to this most sacred duty, the very purpose of our existence, may we never answer, I pray thee, Hold me excused. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.